the king's pride. In uh, 1717, when Francis Louis XIV died, his body lay in a golden coffin. He had called himself the Sun King, and his court was the most magnificent in all Europe. To dramatise his greatness, he had given orders that during his funeral, the cathedral would be only dimly lighted with only a special candle set above his coffin. As thousands waited in hushed silence, Bishop Mazalon began to speak. Then slowly, reaching down, he snuffed out the candle, saying, Only God is great. If you are here last week, I was um, talking about King Hezekiah and how he had a heart after God. He ripped down the altars and the, the bales and Asherah poles that were in the kingdom and uh, he was turning his, his heart and mind to God. And Israel, just in this context of 2 Kings 18, Israel, you can see there, the northern kingdom was taken away already. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated his covenant, all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. Now, Baron, I didn't get that word switched properly yet, but um, <laughs> you read left to right. But um, Shema, it has a double meaning. So the word obeyed and listened are the same word in the Hebrew. And I was saying last week that in the English we can listen, but then we don't always obey. But in the Hebrew, it's both. <laughs> you listen and you obey. It's the one word, double-sided coin if you like. And so here was King Hezekiah, in a sense trapped like a bird in the cage in Jerusalem. And the word from God was to stay in Jerusalem because the Lord himself was going to defend Jerusalem. All the other fortified cities in Judah had been started to be um, captured. And so Jerusalem was on um, Sennacherib, king of Assyria's uh, mind. And here we have obedience of Hezekiah. I want you to come, because I took the uh, story from 2 Kings, now I want to have a look at 2 Chronicles. I want to have a look at King Hezekiah from 2 Chronicles. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles, starting in chapter 32. And I'm just going to read from verse 24. And so this is the account, which is a little bit different from uh, the king's account and also in Isaiah, his account as well. So we're in 2 Chronicles, starting in 32. Ah, oh, thank you, Melissa. <laughs> if anyone else want a Bible? Sorry, I should ask. Anyone else needing a Bible? All good? Okay. Second Chronicles, chapter 32, verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord, who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown to him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come upon them during the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great riches and honour, and he made treasures for his, uh, for his silver and his gold, treasury, sorry, for his silver and for his gold, and for his precious stones, spices and shields, and all kinds of valuables. He also made buildings to store the harvest of grain, new wine and oil. And he made stores for various kinds of cattle and pens for the flocks. He built villages and acquired great numbers of flocks and herds, for God had given him very great riches. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gion spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. But when envoys 
were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land. God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. The other events of Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Hezekiah rested with his fathers and was buried on the hill where the tombs of David's descendants are. All Judah and the people of Jerusalem honoured him when he died, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. You'll notice uh, there's a couple of things that were stated in um, verses 27 and 29. It reads, Hezekiah had very great riches. And then at the end in 29 it mentioned, for God had given him the very great riches. It's quite clear where the riches come from. (laughs) Um, scripture, Scripture doesn't hide that from us. Now, what was this miraculous sign that they were coming to see? Or hear about, I should say. Don't tell me you've forgotten. (laughs) The sun. Very good. So um, it was put to him. Um, He had the option of the sun going forward ten steps or back ten steps. But he said, I want it to go back ten steps because that appears to be harder um, for the sun to do that. And that's exactly what happened. The sun went back ten steps. And this was a sign that he would um, once again go before God in the temple and um, he would be healed, he would live for another 15 years and uh, what an awesome sign that was. The amazing thing is that he wasn't the only one that saw this sign. And this is just the artist's impression, uh, exactly what it looked like, I'm not sure, but there is an actual sundial there with steps behind Um, So the scripture talks about the steps and the shadow moving backwards and um, this is a sign for him. So just repeating um, from verse 24 to 25. In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign and that's the sign, the sun going backwards 10 steps. But Hezekiah's heart was proud. And he did not respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. I was just thinking uh, last week I was talking about how the uh, convoys came from Assyria and they basically were speaking um, clearly and openly before uh, the gate of the city and telling them to surrender. Hezekiah doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't follow God. You need to listen to the king of Assyria because he's going to come and destroy you. So you better come on out. Come on out and enjoy the figs and your, your uh, grapes, etc. And um, here we had a, uh, an invitation to reject what God was actually saying. God said to stay in the city of Jerusalem, remain, and I will defend the city for you. How many uh, soldiers and commanders were destroyed by the angel? Anyone remember? 185,000, yes, very good, very good. An incredible... Um, standing of God, he destroyed 185,000 men and commanders in the the Assyrian army and they went back home to Nineveh. I just want to um, bring up another text to you. Just before, actually, sorry. (laughs) When I think of proudness, I just go right back to the very beginning and before... When uh, we have a scene is Ezekiel 28:17, I'll just read it to you. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. And this is really a picture of Lucifer turning into Satan or the devil, where his um, heart became proud on account of his beauty, and he was corrupted. He corrupted his wisdom. And he was thrown down to earth. What's that saying? Um, Pride comes before a a fall. (laughs) And literally, that's exactly what happened with uh, our our angel Lucifer. He fell from heaven, um, cast out of heaven. But when the envoys 
were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign, that is the sun going back ten steps, that had occurred in the land. God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. and to test him everything that was in his heart. You know, when, um, when they came, the envoys, the first time, and said, come out of the city, otherwise you'll be destroyed. Don't listen to Hezekiah or your God. Hezekiah had word from the Lord that he was going to be victorious if he stayed in Jerusalem. This kind of connection that he had with God through the prophet Isaiah was taken away. God left him to his own. He wanted to test him, to see what was happening in his own heart. And I just want to read to you, the occurrence of this miracle presented Hezekiah, this is the sun going back, with an unusual opportunity to bear witness to the power and the goodness of God. When you think about it, He was dying. He was about to die. So that in itself, being healed, is a miraculous thing. And yet there's this sign that the sun goes back and others witness it. What an opportunity you have for witnessing. What an opportunity to bear witness to the power and the goodness of God. If Hezekiah had been faithful and had told the representatives from Babylon exactly how this incident had taken place and how God had performed a miracle both of healing and of nature, these men could have gone back to Babylonia with a message that would have acquainted many in the adulterous land with the true nature of God. The way would thus have been opened for bringing many to the knowledge and worship of the God who made heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. But what he does instead, as you can see in this picture... He goes and shows his representatives from Babylon some of the things in Jerusalem. Did he show them some of the things in Jerusalem? (laughs) He showed them everything. Hello? (laughs) Shouldn't you, like, retain something? (laughs) He shows them just everything. Everything. All the treasures, all the glory of Jerusalem was revealed. He was left to his own. There was no command from God to say, do not show them this or that or humbly walk before them and and present the miracle, miraculous sign that I did for you. Explain it to them. He didn't put words. He didn't give words through Isaiah to Hezekiah. He left him to see what he would do. And it reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar who comes later in the next century um, where he's praising himself, all the things he's made and done. It's kind of the same thing here for Hezekiah. He's just really enjoying just showing them all the things, all his power, his wealth. And then something happens. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come upon them during the days of Hezekiah. And so through the prophet Isaiah, it was said that it won't happen in your lifetime, Hezekiah, but it will happen in the future. We know that Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed and took them away eventually. But it didn't happen in his lifetime. And I find it interesting when I'm reading this story that not only when people are looking at us, Our actions and what we say can actually affect other people. You'll notice here that the Lord's wrath did not come upon them, including the people, his people. So when you're in a position of, I suppose, leadership, especially like as a king, what he does and what he says, the people tend to follow. I was reflecting back when when those men came the first time to the wall and said, come out, the people didn't say anything. Because King Hezekiah told them not to say anything in response. No matter the temptation to rebuke (laughs) those men down there, they didn't do it. They stayed silent. So just think about if he hadn't have repented, 
if he hadn't have repented. I don't doubt the destruction would have come a lot earlier, a lot quicker. Can you see what I'm saying? That our sin, and if we don't repent of that sin, and in this case it was pride, it was pride. In a couple of verses, um, in Isaiah, it mentions that Hezekiah, he wept bitterly and God heard his prayer and saw his tears. So he was really sorry for the way he had acted in regards to his attitude, the pride with these men from Babylon, and he really repented and he confessed before God what he had done wrong. I love a, a proverb Found in 24.16, it just says, For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again, but the wicked are brought down by calamity. So we have a picture of righteous men, or a righteous man, getting back up again. And this is what happens with Hezekiah, is getting up again because he has repented of his pride, of what he has done wrong. And once again, God is with him again, and there's no... They're allowed to be free of the enemy. You know, there's a, um, a modern-day parable, and it goes like this. There's two ducks in a pond, and they have a friend, the frog. And uh, the pond dries up, and so the two ducks decide it's uh, time to relocate. And the next pond is a long, long way away, so frog, the friend, can't hop all the way. So they come up with a, a uh, scheme, a device, which is going to save their friend, the frog. So they grab a stick and they put it between their two beaks and they tell their friend the frog to jump on with his mouth and hang on. And so they take off and they fly off with their friend the frog. And as they're flying off with the friend the frog, there's a farmer in the field and he thinks, wow, what an amazing great idea. Who came up with that idea? And the frog yells out, I did. <clears throat> Was it saying pride comes before a fall? <laughs> the test, just uh, reading from, um, the, uh, from Nicholas F.D., it says the test was not for God's information but for Hezekiah's benefit. The pride that led to the king's failure had already taken root in his heart if unchecked, would have led to his ruin. In mercy, God permitted circumstances to arise that revealed to Hezekiah the true condition of his heart. The experience illustrates God's manner of working in the development of human character. Men are often not aware of the defects of their natures. Only when they are confronted with various tests do these weaknesses become apparent. If a test accomplishes its purpose so that the soul is duly exercised, no further test upon that particular point may be necessary. If the soul rebels under the rebuke, further tests and trials may be sent until either reformation results or the case is abandoned as hopeless. The Christian may thus take courage in trial. And I was just reflecting too that, yeah, once again, Hezekiah's own life um, had been saved by God. Um, that promise of 15 years could have been cut short as well. Just reading from Isaiah 48, 9 to 11. For my, own, for my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you. So as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you. Though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Wow. So God is really wanting Jerusalem, Hezekiah and the people to shine in that, that area, that country, and to also shine to the Babylonians. And that's why it was such a, um, a missed opportunity of witnessing to them. Just uh, reading a little bit from Testimonies for the Church. 
The fact that we are called upon to endure trial provides that the Lord Jesus sees in us something very precious, which he desires to develop. If he saw in us nothing whereby he might glorify his name, he would not spend time in refining us. We do not take special pains in pruning brambles or spiky bushes. Jesus Christ does not cast worthless stones into his furnace. It is valuable ore that he tests. The blacksmith puts the iron and steel into the fire that he may know what manner of metal they are. The Lord allows his chosen ones to be placed in the furnace of affliction in order that he may see what temper they are of and whether he can mould and fashion them for his work. For his work. So I believe every single one of us, we may not be in Jerusalem, (laughs) but we represent in our own homes and communities, we represent God. And he wants every single one of us to not fall into the trap, (laughs) whether it's pride or other sin, but to remember if something does happen that we do go back and repent and confess of what we've done and he will help us to stand back up again and to keep going. So that is my, um, my charge to you today, church. And as we continue this service, I pray that we all will look into our own hearts and uh, maybe to uplift before him uh, what is happening in our own hearts. I'm going to ask Bahrain to come forward just to pray for us before we go into our uh, foot washing time. And then we'll just give you some instructions. I might just do that first before he prays. So what we'll do is we'll have uh, the men just meet up the front. we have a bit of a curtain. Ladies, and if you're here as um, a married couple, we've got a room there that you can meet in to do foot washing as well. So three, three areas, and um, our leaders will look after you in those, those areas, and they'll close in prayer with you. But I'm just going to ask Byron to come and just uh, have a prayer with us before we, we go into the foot washing. Guy, can I invite you to bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for the ordinance that we have here. Not just the partaking of the bread and the wine, but that major object lesson about humility. As we go about our daily lives, in our self-assertion, we often have a misplaced trust in ourselves. And we thank you for the ordinance of the foot washing where we are reminded that we must serve one and another. And Lord, uh, as, uh, as Jesus did himself, with his mindset, his love, his care, should we do the same to one and another. Thank you for that direction. And we ask that there will be a blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen.